I'd like to welcome you all here. But before we get started in this very special SFU CED public lecture, we respectfully acknowledge that SFU Burnaby is located on unceded traditional territories of the Coast Salish people, including the Tsleil-Waututh, Coquitlam, Squamish, and Musqueam nations. And I'm honored to be joining you from Invermere, BC, the shared unceded home of the Squamish, the Kiskanuk, and Tanaha Nation, and the chosen homeland of the Tumby Valley Métis. My name is Ryan Watmo, and I'm the C SFU CED Program Director. Since 1989, SFU's Community Economic Development Program has been a leader in bringing about social, ecological, and economic change. Defined by our professor, Sean Markey, CED is an approach for generating economic opportunity and addressing social and ecological issues at the local level. CED has also been understood simply as a holistic approach to community problem solving. At its foundation, CD is an approach for meeting needs and solving problems in a socially inclusive and ecologically sustainable manner. Research has referred to a set of five principles that help differentiate CD from other traditional forms of economic development. And we are pleased that today, many of those traditional economic development practices and practitioners are moving towards our five principles too. It's my pleasure to introduce today's SFUCD public lecture presenter, Mary Beth Doucette, for her talk titled, How I Make Sense of Indigenous-Led Organizations in Urban and Rural Contexts, Reflexively Positioning Self in Relationship to CED. Mary Beth is a lecturer at Cape Breton University's MBA in CED program. But first, I'm going to introduce Barry Riom, Director of Cape Breton University's MBA in CED program. Barry? I'm going to stop sharing my screen and then turn it over to you. Thanks very much, everyone. Uh, uh, we're very proud of uh, Mary Beth Doucette here at CBU, and we're coming to you from the other coast uh, here in Nova Scotia and uh, from the land of the uh, Mi'kmaq. Uh, we are very proud to be uh, located on the unceded territory uh, here in the Mi'kmaq lands of, of uh, Cape Breton Island, Nova Scotia. So. Uh, uh, good to hear we've got such a great coast-to-coast uh, -coast represent, uh, representation today. You may be aware of our MBA in Community Economic Development Program, or you may not. Uh, we've traditionally been delivered in person, uh, five or six cities across Canada, depending on when you take that measure. Um, however, during COVID, we, we started to deliver our program virtually with, with some uh, what we call our MTZ or Mountain Time Zone Virtual Cohort and ETZ Eastern Time Zone Virtual Cohort. Uh, so now it, it's, it's something that's more accessible to those who may be living in BC, for example, where we've never been uh, uh, delivering our MBA program. Uh, our MBA program is delivered uh, online on weekends, and uh, uh, it, uh, it, it is now available to you if you'd like to study our program, uh, taking the program online. So you'll see we have Mountain Time Zone and Eastern Time Zone. Um, uh, you keep scrolling, Brian, that, or, or Ryan, that'll be great. Uh, and uh, uh, with those three courses, tuition that would normally be around $27,000 drops to around 22. Uh, we charge by the course, so if you get a transfer credit, you not only don't have to take it, you don't have to pay for it. So it's kind of a, a good setup. Um, so if you have any, Ryan, if you'd be so kind as to drag that into the, the chat box, and if you, any of you are interested in our MBA program uh, and would like to email your resume and unofficial transcripts to me, I can tell you uh, your admission, I can tell you GMAT waiver, um, but of course, if you have that SFU uh, certificate with a 75% average, I can guarantee you'll be getting three transfer credits and a GMAT waiver toward our program. And Mary Beth, I will turn it over to you finally. So thanks very much, everyone. Enjoy. Thanks, Mary. Hi, everyone. <laughs> uh it's noon wherever you, for a lot of you it's noon for me it's four o'clock in the afternoon and i had planned to spend a little bit more time preparing uh today than i that i had a chance to so uh thank you for your patience uh as barry said um i am happy to be here today um i gway hello gway uh is a Mi'kmaq word for hello donda luisi mary beth Dusset, um and I'm really happy to be here joining everyone today in this conversation virtually from my home uh, in the traditional and unceded territory uh, of the Mi'kmaq people in mi'kmaq or as most people would know it as Atlantic Canada. Um, and I just wanted to, before I start talking, say Walaliak, thank you to Ryan and others at uh, SFU for inviting me to present today. Um, 
I am also thankful for SFU and CBU, so Ryan and Barry together, that they were able to coordinate this. So this is the beginning part of what would normally be my class time. Uh, and so I don't have to like double up on presentations uh, when my, when, you know, like we all are trying to manage our time. And so having the ability to overlap some things is always helpful. Um, so in the pro pro promotional piece, um, I said that I believe it is uh, essential for everyone working in the space of CED to be attentive to one's positionality. Um, and while on one hand, this could easily turn into 30 minutes of me talking about myself, uh, that's not really my intention. Um, my, my point or what I wanna uh, do today is not shamelessly promote CBU or talk about what all the great things that are, are going on locally here. Um, my intention is instead to show you how and why I think that reflexivity and positionality are important for me as someone who is often moving uh, between spaces and communities of practice. So um, even the questions that Ryan was asking, how many people are practitioners and how many people are in government and how many people are in education, I occupy all those spaces at different points in time at different, different parts of the day. Uh, and so I feel very much like it's important for me to be able to think about not only who I am and how I'm coming into the conversation, but um, who are the people that I'm going to be talking to. So I love this space of, um, of CED and CED practitioners. Uh, and what I'm presenting today is what I would normally be presenting in the second class of uh, this course that I'm teaching in the winter. Uh, which is community economic development in urban and rural First Nations. Um, and so the whole concept of like how we engage with community is, is central. Um, and so in this presentation, uh, there's three takeaways that I, I hope that you can um, take away at the end of the presentation that you leave with thinking about um, the first one is that like I've found uh, in my meetings and the spaces that I'm moving between, um, and the variety of people that I work with in organizations, it's much easier to navigate and to understand what's going on if I am familiar with <laughs> the narratives that I'm drawing on and why I'm drawing on them. Like, where are they coming from? What communities of practice are using them? And so that's where uh, reflexivity helps me to create more productive relationships with others. Um, the other point that I want you to leave with thinking about today is um, there are some amazing Indigenous-led organizations across the country in Canada uh, in various industries and, and contexts that we can, we can learn from. I didn't realize coming into this conversation, bad on me, that we'd be talking to people potentially from outside of Canada as well. So I hope that you can keep up with realizing, you know, like we're going to be talking about reconciliation a little bit, and that's because that's the world um, that is the world of Canada right now in CED and other spaces is dominated by the, the concept of Indigenous and uh, Canadian relationships. Um, and the final point is in every region and every profession and in every industry, there are Indigenous leaders and allied individuals ready and willing to advise. Um, and I'll explain why I, I highlight this uh, as we go along. So, um, so starting off the top self-identification, I am someone uh, who identifies as both a settler Canadian and of Mi'kmaq heritage. And so my ancestors on both sides have lived in this space, occupied uh, Cape Breton, Unamagi for at least 200 years and on my father's side for much, much, much longer. Um, eons really. And so, uh, starting out thinking about, you know, like, who am I and what, what am I bringing to the conversation? I also want to recognize that in Cape Breton, in Nova Scotia, we are very aware of the relationship between settler Canadians um, and Mi'kmaq people. And so on the screen here, you see, like, we have a territorial acknowledgement. They're, they're all over campus. They're all over uh, the community in Sydney proper, there's evidence of both Mi'kmaq and uh, settler Canadian heritages being celebrated. Um, and we have, you know, like out front of CBU here, you see in the bottom um, thing, we have the Canadian flag, the Nova Scotia flag, and the Mi'kmaq flag all flying 
in our courtyard. And so there's always these symbols of relationship that are, are constantly there. And I find that for me, those are really important uh, cues because when I go across the country, you're not necessarily seeing uh, Indigenous presences uh, in the same way, although things have been changing uh, recently. Uh, and so as I continue um, thinking about all of this, I also want to, <laughs> talking about re re reflexivity and relationality, um, I also have to recognize that I do not present things in a linear way. I'm not a very linear thinker. Uh, and so um, I know that that can make it hard for some people who aren't used to listening to, you know, like people like that talk the way I do. <laughs> uh, and so I wanna make this as easy as possible for you to follow. And so I appreciate that. And I'm going to start with uh, what I would normally have as the conclusion of my presentation. And I'm gonna present four slides, uh, four tools and resources that I use to encourage, and I encourage my students to use. Um, and these are tools that help me position myself in my work. And then once I've showed them to you, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about, about me and, and how and why I think they're useful. So the first, uh, the first point is uh, around critical sense making. So amongst all the other things that I'm doing, uh, working as the Pretty Crawford Chair and teaching at CBU and just living life generally, I'm also a PhD candidate uh, at St. Mary's University. And so I'm working on my dissertation, uh, hoping to defend that in the near future. And um, although it hasn't been defended yet, uh, the general topic of my, my dissertation is around two-eyed seeing and critical sense making. And so I don't know how many people are necessarily familiar with uh, the critical sense making framework. Um, it's, I use it, I'm not going to defend my thesis today. I use this though, uh, <laughs> because I think there's four constructs that are really helpful when I'm entering into spaces that I, I kind of use as cues or anchor points for for when I'm entering into different conversations. One is recognizing what discourses are and what, what's happening, what language we're using, how we're communicating with people. Uh, the second one is recognizing the identity of the sense maker. Um, so again, this idea of intersectionality, not just of the individual, but the organizations and what kind of um, communities of practice you're talking to. Another piece of critical sense making relates to formative context. So the idea of places that have history and stories um, are going to influence what we're doing and how we're acting and how we're reacting to, to change, organizational change, uh, and so does rules and power. And that's, for me, working in Indigenous contexts, a lot of that has to do with, with policy change. Um, and so these four pieces of critical sense making is a foundational piece of what I'm doing for my thesis. Um, and then the caveat here is, the contribution that I'm making through my thesis is recognizing there's also a missing piece because we don't talk about land claims and the policies of colonialism that that impact um, organizations, whether you recognize that these narratives are going on in the background or not. And so the second toolkit that I wanted to highlight or I guess uh, useful thing that is I want to highlight is um, provided by the Native Women's Association of Canada. And here I have a reference for the um, culturally relevant gender-based analysis starter kit. Um, it's a very short, it was published in June 2020. Um, hopefully everyone is aware of the Native Women's Association of Canada. They are an advocacy organization based in Ontario, uh, but they've been doing work around the rights of Indigenous identifying uh, women and um, two-spirit individuals uh, for decades now. I'm gonna say the 1970s, I think, is when they, they got started. Um, and so part of my agency in this space, I think, is to highlight that where there are organizations who are doing some really good work and the Native Women's Association of Canada is one of them. Um, and so they have this starter kit. The starter kit is 20 pages, really short, really easy to use. It's super helpful if you're doing policy work in Canada because it, it sets things up to be useful. Um, and there's like a series of questions, there's worksheets, there's all of those things that are, are really useful. Um, 
when you're working with Indigenous communities or in any communities in Canada, I think is the point that it really, it helps you to, to reflect on who you are and why you're in certain spaces. Um, although that's not, this second one is not on the screen, the Native Women's uh, Association of Canada also produced last year, uh, for those of you who are interested, um, a much longer version of a research and policy toolkit. It's about 150, I'm going to say maybe 200 pages long. Um, and so it's not for the faint of harsh, but it's also a very useful way, uh, a toolkit that's there designed to help people working in policy spaces in Canada to work through how policies are um, gendered, how they're biased, things that they need to consider and, and um, how they can, can change to address the issues that have been raised by Indigenous communities um, following the TRC. Um, so that's just another toolkit that we use. Um, this third thing that I want to highlight in terms of a tool that I use often is Edoopt Monk to Idzing. I don't want to start getting into people show hands, but I if you've used Two Eyed Seeing before, that's awesome. If you haven't, uh, the idea of Edoptimunk Two Eyed Seeing is brought forward to us. Um, it's very familiar locally in Atlantic Canada because Elder Albert Marshall, uh, his late wife, Merdina Marshall, and Cheryl Bartlett, who was a Canada Research Chair in, at, at CBU, they put together this model of Edoopt Monk to I'd Seeing or Collaborative Co-Learning for Teaching in Science Education. And the premise of this is that if we are working together in spaces where there's multiple people, um, you take the best of one knowledge system, which would be the Eurocentric knowledge system, and the other knowledge system, which would be locally here, the Mi'kmaq knowledge system, and hold them in space next to one another um, because they're both valid and valuable and when we hold them next to one another, we can learn um, more from each. So it's this idea that if you have something to compare to, uh, then it'll help you to understand. I say, um, I don't have this reference, I didn't get it up on my slide, but uh, there's an article that was published around collaborative co-learning in by Bartlett Marshall and Marshall in 2012. There's lots of research that's been done on two I'd seeing since then, um, but I keep going back to this 2012 article because it talks about their process of collaborative co-learning in which two I'd seeing is a guiding principle. It's not necessarily the way used the same way as as we sometimes see it used or assumed to be used in in policy spaces. Um, and then the final point that I just want to make before I move on and talk about me, I'm going to be talking about me for the next 20 minutes, uh, is related to other resources that exist. So in the general space of intersectionality, the buzzword that we hear about all the time now, um, it, that is part of the NWAC model as well as understanding that intersectionality influences the way we make sense of things. Um, but there's also lots of tools that I've been drawing on um, through gender work and organization, gender diversity studies um, that talk about different research methods and toolkits that help us position ourselves. The first one that I um, will be modeling today, I guess, is the idea of um, very being reflexive and the value of needing to know and think about and spend time understanding where our thoughts come from, um, why we believe things are true, what our biases are. And so cultivating uh, reflexivity is really, really important to that. Um, but there's also the idea of intersectionality. There's lots of board games and there's um, like power walks and things that you often see in CED spaces where people try and encourage us to think about, you know, like the difference between communities of practice and the different barriers and opportunities that exist in those spaces. So um, all of that to say, there's lots of these tools in my class when I am teaching the MBA. I will be talking about a variety of them. There's also other tools that are uh, important for different industries. Um, and I'm not diminishing any of them, but I these ones are, I think, the most practical or pragmatic ones that can be really useful when you're working in space spaces. Okay. So I'm also gonna, so 
now you're starting to see how I ramble. <laughs> Lee, I can see you on my screen. So when I have a, like a time check, you can like give me the five minute warning or the 10 minute warning because I, I probably will, will ramble. Um, so Barry introduced me off the top or as Ryan did as the Pretty Crawford Chair. As the Pretty Crawford Chair, I'm an instructor, a researcher, uh, a generally okay person, I think. Um, and that, you know, like professional hat is one that I wear often. Um, I also am someone, as I said, who identifies as both settler Canadian and of Mi'kmaq heritage. And so this map that you see on the screen just gives you a sense of space when I'm talking about, you know, like the place that we're located, because place matters a lot. Um, the place that we're located is mi'kmaq -y. And so if that place on the map looks familiar to you because it's like, oh, that's Atlanta, Canada. Yep, it's both. It's Mi'kmaq and it's Atlanta, Canada. And we have Canadian jurisdiction and we have Mi'kmaq jurisdiction overlapping in these spaces. Uh, and we also have, you know, like four provinces and four provincial uh, jurisdictional spaces, as well as municipalities and all the rest of it. So we're living in very complicated spaces where, you know, like, People are creating rules uh, for how we want to operate and how we can we can do things. Um, this is not again not shameless self promotion, but recognizing that if you're walking through CBU as I do weekly, um, coming up to my office, you will see both of these things on the wall, which is like you're always looking at yourself in the mirror walking through the hallways, recognizing again that th these are the spaces that we're in and the, the dialogues and the way that we come into these spaces is where the Purdy Crawford chair has a prominent space in the, um, in the Shannon School of Business. Um, whether you wanna be on the wall or not, they're putting you up there. So uh, some of you might ask, Somebody just recently asked me, uh, who was Pretty Crawford and um, what? why is there a chair named after him anyhow? Uh, and so I'm, that's a, a longer story that I'm not really going to get into the details of, but uh, Pretty Crawford, the late Pretty Crawford, was um, a very prominent Canadian business lawyer. Um, he and Chief Terry both sat on the Shannon School of Business Advisory Board uh, for a number of years. And back in about 2008, they were sitting at a meeting uh, and the story, as the story goes, Chief Terry and uh, Purdy Purdy said, Chief, what do we have to do to help you with your community um, and the economic development model that we see that it seems to be so successful at Member 2? Um, and Chief Terry basically said, you know, if there's one thing that we could do at CBU and then nationally, uh, it's encourage Indigenous people to study in business studies and to encourage more Canadians to know about Indigenous perspectives of business when they're going through business classes. So I say this uh, because it's important context to recognize these are the conversations that were happening you know, like in our local area around 2008, which is about the same time as the TRC was being launched. Um, and so it's not a response to the TRC. A lot of the work that we were doing was prior to the TRC's final report coming out. Um, and as a result of that, I get asked different questions now <laughs> than I would have been asked 10 years ago when we were getting, when we were getting things off the ground. Um, and so when the Crawford chair was originally launched, um, and I should also add, yes, I realize it is problematic that a uh, chair in Aboriginal business studies is named after uh, a white Canadian lawyer, uh, but it was also done deliberately and with advice of the local Mi'kmaq leaders who wanted um, to increase the profile of the chair, recognizing we had to raise some money and that um, we wanted to make sure that it had legitimacy within the legal business community. And so there's a lot of other pieces that have to go into that, that story. Um, and as problematic as it may be to some people, it is also um, with the guidance and leadership of, of, of Mi'kmaq leaders that we, we chose to do that. Um, and so 
when we started getting into this space, we were studying uh, community economic development based primarily off of um, the model of member two, uh, because at the time, member two had seen uh, a large amount of success. Um, and it was an interesting situation to be in because although member two was really, really starting to be one of the most successful First Nation communities in Canada, economically speaking, um, it was successful despite the fact that everyone else around us, the reason why we have the CED program at CBU, everyone else around us was suffering from economic decline that had been going on uh, as a post-industrial um, mining community and fishing community. And so there was this, you know, like interesting comparison of although people were telling, like with me, I was growing up in the 1980s and my father was saying, you have to go to Toronto, you have to leave here, you have to leave this space if you want to have a good life. And then you're contrasting that with um, the idea that, <laughs> you know, if you leave, there's nobody there in the community to to do the work that you would need to, to grow a healthy community. So um, what was interesting to me uh, at the time of me doing my MBA at CBU was this idea of, well, if all of these troublesome things are happening in the local community and CED is a solution, uh, why is it that member two is so successful despite all of these seemingly uh, similar dialogues and discourses. And so uh, that's what prompted us to start studying the member two model. And that's what was the foundation of the Purdy Crawford chair. Um, and so we've been studying community economic development from a First Nations perspective um, and comparing the member two model to other models across the country and across North America and, and internationally. Um, for uh, over a decade now. Um, so as I said, we were doing this before the TRC came about. Um, and um, at that time, I'm just trying to catch up with my notes here. Uh, at that time, I would pretty simplistically describe what we were studying or the space that we were occupying as the middle space between uh, these three dots. and I love Venn diagrams, so just be prepared. There's gonna be a couple more of them um, as, as this presentation continues. And so at that time in 2008, I would have described the work that we were doing uh, with the Crawford Chair as being this middle ground space between um, business management studies, education, uh, Mi'kmaq and indigenous ways of knowing and community relationships uh, in educational spaces, and uh, the Canadian political and legal histories or business law and also in educational spaces. And understanding that, you know, like one part, so I have the pointer saying like Crown Indigenous Relations is over here. And then that's part, partly understanding history. The idea of Etiwaptamong Tuait Seeing, which I talked about earlier, is the space between Mi'kmaq knowledges and Canadian knowledge systems. Um, and then the Crawford Chair is right here in that that middle space between all of these three things. And so um, using that as kind of your starting point, when I would be teaching this class that I'm, I said I'm currently teaching is in urban and rural communities, um, I would start out by saying, okay, well, what do you think of when you think of urban and rural? And usually people think about those two center circles and, um, over time, we also have to recognize like there's super urban. So super urban to me is Toronto, Vancouver, <laughs> like, uh, Calgary, the really the really big cities. Everybody else who are urban, large large municipalities and large cities. There's also rural and small cities in in municipal areas, which is where, you know, like Sydney or Cape Breton is sometimes thought of as rural, but really we are a municipality and so we're also an urban center within a rural space. Uh, and then on the on the far end, which is really important for talking about Indigenous context, is the remote communities. Um, and so when I would start teaching about this, you know, like five years ago, we'd be able to kind of categorize communities of practice in even in Indigenous or Aboriginal contexts 
pretty like 95% within these, you know, like structures because um, you wouldn't have as many urban Aboriginal communities. Member two is an urban Aboriginal community. At When I started studying member two, we were one of like three. Um, now there's a whole new mix of what it means to be an urban Aboriginal reserve community. And you have urban reserves being developed and we have like new um, structures that are forming around, you know, like the urban and the super, super urban and, and all that type of stuff. Um, and so all of this is just to help recognize like what perspective you're coming into the situation with. If you're coming through the Canadian lens, what space are you coming from? What province are you coming from? And what do you have in common because of the type of community where you're located? If you're in an urban center, usually that didn't involve having a reserve. Um, and so the urban indigenous communities tended to be more diverse. They would be, you know, like oriented around friendship centers. They would be, you know, like trying to find community despite, you know, like a very large uh, diversity of cultures uh, in these spaces. And if you were in rural communities, you would probably be talking about um, indigenous communities as being on reserves or close to reserves. Uh, and there was less, things were slightly more clear than they, they seem to be today as things continue to change. Um, over time, indigenous communities are moving away from reserves or moving more into urban settings and, and you have all kinds of other changes that are happening as well. Um, so what was the impact of the TRC in my, the way that I've been making sense of things? Uh, this diagram I formed for uh, intro to Indigenous business is to recognize when we're talking about two-eyed seeing from a business lens, you have to, for me, I say, you have to recognize that you have the Canadian economy, which is what we assume as being the center. And you also have Indigenous identity business relationships there is an indigenous economy and more and more you're seeing like indigenous, um, I think indigenous economics, I forget the name of the, the woman, I have it, Carol Ann Hilton, she wrote a whole book on like, what does indigenous economics mean? Um, I'm seeing some nodding heads. So, you know, like people are familiar with what she's doing. So there's all kinds of, you know, like new things that are happening in this green, what is the green space on the screen um, and recognizing that Canadian relationships are still happening. Um, and so when we're talking about indigenous community economic development, these indigenous identity relationships are working to assert sovereignty and renewal and reconciliation. And so we're trying to reestablish economies that had been denied for 100, 150 years and reestablish the rules that are necessary to make sure that Indigenous economies are, are able to operate the way that they choose to operate. And so um, in the MBA program, until the TRC came out with this, with their calls to action and the final report, um, typically the students who would be in these classes studying in the CED program and studying in the two courses that we have, which is First Nations um, legal contexts and policy contexts and in applied CED and First Nations urban and rural communities, um, typically the students in those classes would be First Nations identifying people working for communities, working for bands. And, and so this space was very familiar to them. I say that since the TRC things have changed a bit is because now we're getting more Canadian and international students realizing how important it is to understand the context and the history and what's going on in Indigenous communities and the Indigenous economy. Um, but they're coming in starting in a, in a very different space and with different formative contexts, different backgrounds and stories to draw from. Um, and so there's that two-eyed seeing piece, understanding Indigenous and understanding Canadian values are not necessarily, their goals are not the same, the values and the structures that they're using are not necessarily the same. And so when we're studying businesses in this green space, we have to think about all of the complexity that we would also think about in other business classrooms talking about business in general. What is the size name, industry, purpose, value, governance structure that we're talking about if you're studying Indigenous economic development. Um, you also have to think about the identity of the business owners and their citizenship and their history and their location and their culture and the values and the levels of embeddedness that they have in their community. 
Um, sometimes these things are taken for granted when we start looking at, you know, like entrepreneurship models, um, and sometimes they're not. But in CED, we would take some of these identity pieces a little bit more seriously um, than you would typically see in an in a introduction to business textbook. Uh, and so this is where my, my model really starts to, to get kind of blown up is also recognizing the value of relationships and the spaces that you're moving in between, um, why it's important to have uh, awareness of intersectionality and your different um, reflexivity about where you're positioned is even if you're working in the Indigenous business space, um, are you working in a government to government context? Are you working in a business to business context? Are you working in a context where you're a business, but you still need to understand how the government's rules are influencing where you're going to locate and what your profits are going to be and whether or not you pay taxes and all of these things. Um, and that is going to be true in this middle space for reconciliation as well, as we have to be able to recognize that all not, not all indigenous organizations have the same goals or operate in the same legal frameworks that um, that you might assume everyone like everyone's working in government or everyone's working in CD and that's just not it's not true if you're an independent business owner who's not living on reserve who is non-status or if you do have status, it isn't necessarily just the owner's identity, but the identity of the business and how it's structured that will determine, you know, like some of the rules and how they apply or government policies and how they apply. And so all of these things uh, in my classes, I try and encourage students to be aware of um, and how they're moving between these, these spaces. Um, and so when I was originally talking about the Pretty Crawford Chair and where we used to fit, a lot of the last two years I've spent trying to wrap my head around where does the Crawford chair sit now in these changing dialogues because I am asked to talk about reconciliation. I realize that is not why I was asked to talk today <laughs> it was necessarily about reconciliation, um, but it is a, a really important piece to how I make sense of what kind of CED work I'm doing and who I'm doing it with is being able to say, you know, like, is it in an indigenous space looking for indigenous sovereignty where everyone that I'm working with is kind of on the same page about that? Or is it somebody who is, you know, like in CBRM proper, the municipality, who want to form new relationships with indigenous identifying communities like member two um, and create reconciliation pathways? They're both very valid projects, but it, it is a different lens that you have to be, you know, like understanding things through because like I said the goals aren't necessarily the same um and then I like I ground myself in Mi'kma'ki as much as possible and so Ilnu uh, is the Mi'kmaq word for uh our people um it's Mi'kmaq is a French derivation of a Mi'kmaq word that means friends um and so I have them in like the Ilnu governance structures are in the center there, uh, but also recognizing that there's other things that are happening that are changing even more rapidly now than they were um, five years ago when the TRC calls to action came out. Um, but then because of COVID, there's all these other policies and processes that are changing that have nothing to do with reconciliation. Um, and so this space that we're working in is a very dynamic space of uh, community building, society building, fixing things, trying to you know, like improve relationships between, between nations. And so <clears throat> being able to position whatever projects you're working on, and I say projects, not necessarily individuals, uh, is really important. And for me, um, this scatter plot is a, a number of different projects that I've been working on to understand the spaces that I were occupying in these different conversations um, and why intersectional, like a, a reflexive awareness of my intersections and the spaces um, is because um, if I'm not paying attention, I can slip really quickly into a space where I'm talking and saying and using words that are either resisted 
or get people back gets people's backs up or they are just missing misinterpreting what i'm saying because it's a common you know like set of discourses within indigenous sovereignty movements um it might not be the same in a business school and vice versa uh and so it's it's important to understand you know like why i'm using certain words and what their meanings really are intended to convey and and what spaces we're occupying uh, so that is basically it. It wasn't the most organized. I apologize. There's been some things going on today. I had a much uh, a vision of something much more celebratory at the end of my slides, and I just didn't get to the last slides yet. So um, if you have questions, if I lost track of you somewhere along the way, please let me know. Uh, the point is um, those toolkits like I said at the very beginning, I think are they're, they're useful and there are other toolkits that you might also find useful. Um, but that's that's it. Lal and thank you, Laliak. Thank you so much, Mary Beth. Uh, yeah, well, let's open it up to questions. We've got 15 minutes. I'm sure there's lots. Feel free to raise your hand and if not, uh, not comfortable there, feel free to, to type that in the chat. I also have another question from uh, Cynthia. Will you provide tools for building these relationships as well as digital platforms? Um, yeah, so that's an interesting question for building these relationships. The, the challenge, even picking like what tools I wanted to share um, is, you know, like, again, moving between spaces. There's so many toolkits depending on what you're trying to do right so for us uh in the mba program talking about ced um i didn't put them up there but the canadian aboriginal native development officers network also have a ton of great toolkits that they're developing for you know like municipalities and for relationship building in in municipal relations that isn't necessarily um for everyone if you're not working with you know, like with municipalities, but they have a, a ton of toolkits. Um, the AFOA, Aboriginal Finance Officers Association, if you're in accounting, they have guidelines and toolkits and whatnot for that are really useful for uh, accountants. Um, if you're working in banking and finance, the First Nations Finance Authority have a series of toolkits and resources that are available. So I think the point that I wanted to make is just like, depending on where you're located and what industry you're working in, there is a very good chance that there's a book written, there's a toolkit available, there's something online if you're looking for it, uh, but it's knowing that you have to look um, and, and reach out um, to these organizations, I think is, is the important piece. A lot of people who come and ask me questions um, are asking because they don't even know where, where to begin. Um, and that's why I said like, for me, positionality and understanding, not just my perspective, but why are you asking and where, what pers perspective you're looking for? It's what's most helpful for you. I want to be as helpful as possible. Um, but there's not, I don't know, there's not one, one great answer. And just uh, following up on that, I'm going to provide a, a couple uh, toolkits or resources or, or frameworks uh, that uh, Mary Beth mentioned. One was Carolyn Hinton. Hilton, sorry, Hilton's Indigenomics. Uh, that actually was a course she developed in our SFPCD program just over a decade ago. And more recently, uh, Chappelle Montsiem uh, from Squamish, there you go, yeah. right there, uh, from the Squamish Nation, uh, and Lily Raphael have uh, authored the Step in the River, a framework for economic reconciliation. So those are a couple other great resources if you definitely in British Columbia. Yeah. Yeah, there's a ton of resources. And the other thing I guess I want to highlight is just like, there's a ton of resources in BC. Like I know that you're located in on the Pacific Coast, and there's a more work being done there to create, you know, like work and toolkits um, than there is in other in other places. It doesn't necessarily translate directly into the spaces that I'm operating in either in the Atlantic uh, Treaty Territory, where we have peace and friendship treaties. Um, I said uh, up front, you know, like my ancestors on each side one side is the settler canadian irish english heritage we've been you know like living in this space on this island of cape breton um for 
over 200 years. Um, that's older than Canada. They've been here longer than Canada has been here. And so when we talk about treaties of the Atlantic, of Mi'kmaq, they're peace and friendship treaties that were signed long before Canada was ever imagined to be a country. Um, and so the dialogues, the discourses, the formative context of the relationship is different um, if we're going to go back to treaty promises than it might be in, in BC, which um, those relationships were formed after. I just want to jump back to one of your earlier slides on the dynamics of CD and Ermit and rule. And uh, again, another Venn diagram overlapping circles. I love this because I always get asked, are we more focused on or CV work better in, in urban areas versus rural areas? And are there uh, differences, significant differences? Yeah, there are, but there's more similarities than there are differences. And I really like your uh, distinction with remote and even the superurban uh, as huh. sort of the both ends of that spectrum or that continuum. Yeah, well, and so um, one of my students last year, maybe it was two years ago now, uh, it's really interesting. In Mi'kmaq, uh, we are the Atlantic Canadian provinces. Um, in Nova Scotia, there is only one Indigenous nation. It is the Mi'kmaq Nation, but it is only part of the Mi'kmaq Nation. Um, in Newfoundland, there is also the Mi'kmaq Nation territory is Newfoundland. Um, but because Newfoundland was the last province to sign into Confederation, the narratives and the stories of, of what that means are very, very different for uh, First Nations, Mi'kmaq people. Um, anyhow, in that conversation we were having in Newfoundland and Mi'kmaq Nation in Newfoundland, talking about identity and positionality, how do you determine what is rural and remote? And what does that mean in the context of the province of Nova Scotia? And the solution apparently is how far do you live from a Tim Hortons and how many, what is the population density of the Tim Hortons that you're living close to. <laughs> Somebody else uses Starbucks. I feel like Tim Hortons, you know, like works across the across the uh, the country. Um, but yeah, so there's different metrics for how, you know, like how do you think about and conceptualize what the challenges are for communities. Well, that's great. Thank you so much, Mary Beth. Wonderful uh, presentation. And I done a lot of screenshots. I'm going to go back through those Venn diagrams and, and content, um, look at it more closely and, and see how it compares and contrasts to uh, my experiences in, in, in British Columbia and my previous experiences in Ontario. Great. I'd love to hear your feedback on that. <laughs> and just before everyone goes, this was our first lecture, public lecture of 2023, which you can rewatch on the same page that you registered. Thanks to the generosity of our presenters, you can watch all of the previous public lectures on our archives page, uh, which is through sfu.ca forward slash CBD. And now, thanks to Lee, uh, you can watch and share them all from YouTube. We have our own YouTube channel and they are up there getting uh, more and more views every day. Last, uh, last year, I think we had 10. Uh, this year, we're really going to start with Mary Beth and already we have Jonathan Davey, uh, from Scotiabank booked for February and Rob Newell from Royal Roads University in March. So please register for them. And if you like what you heard uh, from us and you like what you heard from, from Barry and Mary Beth, uh, our eight month fully online certificate program for CV professionals could be your next step in developing, revitalizing, and injecting new life into your local economy. Those completing the SFU CV program can now earn 30 points towards the 45 needed for your ECD designation or accreditation through the Economic Developers Association of Canada. It's big news and we have more on its way. Uh, this recognizes the rigor of our program and enables our graduates to continue in the profession. And with that, I'd just like to thank you all for attending today and uh, have yourself a great afternoon.